I think definitions of reconciliation tend to vary a bit, but my own working definition when I'm engaged in something is the transformation of violent or destructive conflict into non-violent and creative disagreement. What is this strange word reconciliation? Of course, coming to work in Coventry means I've got to wrestle with the word and I have learnt to use it less and less. Why? Because it's one of those religious words that sort of nice. Everybody approves of reconciliation. Uh, it's one of those nice things, comfortable things. Um, you, you find it very hard to find people who um, are not impressed when you say, my job is reconciliation. But when I say, it's about loving your enemies. The tone changes. People recognize this is deeply controversial. Um, and this is profoundly difficult. Reconciliation is healing the wounds of history through the restoration of broken relationships and forgiveness. I might, I think I considered adding another word, adding the word covenant the restoration of broken covenant relationships because but that I thought would limit it to a Christian understanding. I tend to present my understanding of reconciliation by saying what it isn't rather than what it is. So reconciliation isn't about resolving conflict, it's about transforming it. Uh, it isn't about eradicating differences, it's about learning to live and inhabit the differences in a more constructive relational way. Uh, and I think reconciliation is very contingent, uh, it's very elusive and it's very much a long-term project and it's something that is very rare. Uh, I think when I hear people claiming that reconciliation has happened I'm always quite sceptical uh, because we never quite fully get there this side of the Perusia and that's why at one level my favourite definition of reconciliation is the one that Stanley Harwas gives which is that reconciliation is when our enemy tells us our story in such a way that we're able to say, yes, that is my story. I think at its very simplest, reconciliation is about hospitality. That's where it starts. That's not the end of it, of course. Reconciliation is about bringing people together to disagree well, bringing people to sit at the table together. I think that's really key. And to work out their disagreements together in order to look towards a transformed and transformative future. So reconciliation is a process, it has to be a process, it's a long process and I think it can't be shortcut. There's a phrase I really like about reconciliation which says that microwave oven reconciliation doesn't last and I think I would absolutely go along with that. It, it's a long process, it's a risky process and the process involves different components, sometimes forgiveness, repentance, restitution, justice, truth, 
mercy, peace. All of these are components of a reconciliation journey. And I think we do well to remember that it's a long and risky process, but a process full of hope as well. Reconciliation is basically bringing enemies together and making them friends. Who is my enemy? It is a person whose story I have not heard. Once we have heard their story, then it's difficult to be their enemy. Then we can begin to start working at reconciliation. I knew a bit about reconciliation before I came here, but I didn't really. It was only when I got here that I realised what the story was really about. Whenever you're dealing with reconciliation, whenever you're dealing with peacemaking, you have to give people something. You give them anything. You give them something to know that you value them. Reconciliation, of course, is about healing broken relationships. And when you are up against bitterness, hatred, a history of, yes, very often murder, then reconciliation, of course, is what it's about. But it's not a theological term we are talking about. It's about taking the risk of doing precisely what Jesus did and asked his disciples to do is to love their enemies. Probably the hardest of all the Christian commandments, if we call it that. To be reconciled with your enemy is to take an enormous risk and in fact to make yourself deeply vulnerable. And that is what Provost Howard did in the middle of a war against Hitler's Nazi Germany. He didn't wait till the war was over. When his own cathedral was destroyed, he confronted the people of Coventry who didn't like it one bit with the challenge, we Christians say no to revenge and yes to forgiveness. That was a provocation. Nobody at that moment thought of forgiving Hitler's Germany. And yet, this was what Provost Howard was saying. He wasn't just saying it. He proclaimed it in practice. And the moment the war was over, when many people were saying the only good German is a dead German, he went to Hamburg, where 40,000 people had been killed by British bombing, uh, and said, how can we help you? Not, are you willing to for ask for forgiveness. No, no. How can we help you, our enemy? Um, so the cathedral, in a sense, established its reputation on that basis. But you can't live off the past. You have to ask now, what does reconciliation mean now? And for most ordinary people, they have to apply it in their personal lives. Enemies are not just political enemies in other nations. Often enough, they're in your own family. They're very close to home. And where the hurt is deepest is where love should be strongest. And often the opposite is the case. One of the mistakes in reconciliation work is to apply a template across different conflicts. Uh, violent or non-violent. But in practice, it is very relationally based. The model we developed while I was involved in leading the CCN, or as we called it then, the International Centre for Reconciliation, ICR, uh, was based around some words beginning with R. The first was research. So you will never understand someone else's conflict, but you need to spend time trying to find out as much as you can. Iteratively, that leads you into a relationship with the people whom you're researching. The research and the relationship have to be those of a servant, not of a master. 
uh, the relationship builds and you begin to see their needs and so you look at what are their needs of relief, of uh, help, of support. And in every conflict, from a family to a nation, there will be needs of relief. As you go through that, you get to the point where you can begin to take far more risk in the process. So you begin to take risks in bringing people together, in putting yourself in an awkward place very often. Uh, following the risk that itself leads into a process of reconciliation. You begin to see people coming together, the transformation of conflict, as I said a few moments ago, from destructive and even violent into creative but still disagreement. You don't try and resolve conflict, you try and reconcile those involved in conflict. And finally, resource and you resource those who are involved so that they themselves can sustainably maintain reconciliation and, for that matter, share it with others in other conflicts. Now, there is a whole underlying theology to that around the incarnation, the presence of Christ among us, the gift of the Holy Spirit as the resource to us, the relationships within the Trinity, God's meeting of our every need, of, our, of his lavish endowment to us, and the risk taken in Jesus' living among us and God himself becoming fully human. All of that is theologically underpinned, but that's the basic way in which I tended to work through the issues, and they're not separate steps. It's a series of spinning plates that end up, hopefully, God willing, with all six spinning at the same time. I think anyone who says, I did that or we did that, any organisation or individual, is just kidding themselves and is very arrogant to boot. We never do it. It is God who does it, and it's also a load of other people who do it. One of my rules in reconciliation, rule of thumb, is that a week of conflict gives you a year of reconciliation work, at least, sometimes a generation. And therefore, five years is but a blink of an eye, and there's no way that one can have accomplished much. You can move things along a bit, and that's a huge achievement. I mean, I was the first appointed director of International Ministry or Centre for International Reconciliation, but there were obviously deep roots long before that, going back, of course, into the history and the story, the Coventry story, which we all know about the Cross of Nails and so on. There were, in fact, many international things already happening. There, were, there was a network of centres, usually in what I would call bilateral relationships with Coventry, uh, places where Cross of Nails had been presented, some of them purely symbolic, but some of them active links. So there was that, there were the Axion Sunitaken volunteers, the young Germans who worked with us. There were international weeks. We had a, a, a Yugoslav week, a Lubeck week, a Czech week, uh, a Norwegian week. So that every year there seemed to be some major week of cultural events in which people from these cities came. So the first two years we spent a lot of time discussing what should the mission statement of CCM be. And at one level, it was already there. Uh, Kenyon Wright had given us it, healing the wounds of history. You know, Community Cross of Nails was his idea when he was appointed the first international canon in the early 1970s. And the Community Cross of Nails came into being in January 1974, trying to make sense of, of all these churches and groups that received the Cross of Nails uh, in the previous 30 years. Uh, and the community was created. And it was to heal the wounds of history the wounds of war, obvious. Uh, for him, it was also the wounds between the Global North and the Global South, economic exploitation of colonialism, uh, and the wounds with the earth. And one of the first ever Christian environmental conferences was run by the Community of Cross of Nails in Atlanta, Georgia, back in the mid-1970s. So that one was already there. We added to it learning to live with difference and celebrate diversity, which recognised the fact that the world we were reconciling with, both the global north, south and the war, were no longer 2,000, 3,000 miles away. They were two yards away, or their next door neighbours, because the world would not come. 
And that was true for most places where Community Cross of Nails is. They were living now with more diverse communities. Difference was on their doorstep. So how do we live with that and celebrate that? And then the third thing was uh, building a culture of peace. How do we help people actually be peace builders? All the reconciliation ministries, all the need for reconciliation was widespread, but that there were two areas where it was universal, where it affected everybody. One was the wound of history of poverty, the, the gap between the rich and the poor in both in nations and between nations. And secondly, the, the gap with nature, the ecological problem, the, the crisis which we're facing in, in ecology. So I said, these are two wounds of history, which if not healed, will end our civilization somehow or other, will certainly transform it. Uh, so, uh, so these two, I said, every Cross of Nails Centre, by all means deal with your local reconciliation, race relations, whatever it be, uh, Palestine, you know, Jewish, Arab, you have your own local situations, but you, you share in one, these two, which are universal, and which and I would like to have seen guidance from here for how local groups could study these two things. What we do in Co Coventry or anywhere else, what, what we try and do here is to make it easier for people to find their own way to reconciliation. There has to be that servant side, but there also has to be that bluntness and toughness about the consequences of non-reconciliation. This is not a luxury option to fit on top of the gospel. It is the sine qua non of the gospel itself. The cross for us as Christians is the centre of reconciliation because the cross is the greatest act of reconciliation in history. It's reconciliation between humanity and God. But if you're dealing with different faith groups, you can't necessarily use the cross. And that's why Josefina de Vasconcellos' Statue of Reconciliation is so important because it was not a cross, but it was people coming together, showing their love for each other. I do think that in that focal moment of the cross, the, the, the story that I've talked about is my definition of reconciliation. That is when the full story of the human predicament is, is unveiled. And the human predicament is our profound alienation from God, from our very selves, from one another, and from the earth. And the cost of that, the injustice of it, the violence of that is revealed to us on the cross. And at that moment, uh, the price of that alienation is absorbed by Christ. I put all my focus on Colossians more than Corinthians and because to me uh, the Colossians passages are about the uniqueness of Christ and the reconciling of all things in Christ. The fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ and that the full, full and complete revelation of that is when reconciliation is complete. And that comes and derives its power and purpose from the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. I wouldn't be quite as narrow as to say that the only way to reconciliation is through the cross. That is the definitive moment in human reconciliation with God and with each other. That's where the barriers are broken down. I think you have to say that yes, the cross is the moment of reconciliation, the ultimate sacrifice. And that taking the cross into ourselves, the cross that so many of us bear and wear, the Coventry cross, um, has to be taken in and made part of our way of living. But that can only happen through incarnation, through resurrection as well. Is the cross the only way to reconciliation? Is Christianity the only way to truly live is the same question put in a different way. 
to which I have to answer no. Um, it is my way. It is the way God has led me and the culture in which I grew up, which is both a Jewish and a Christian one. Um, but it does not correspond with my actual experience. I find people in different cultures um, who are capable, yes, of this love for others, even for enemies. Love is the mystery. And for me personally, I discover that in its greatest perfection in Jesus. I remember always the poem, the presenter, Joseph Poole, another great figure uh, who wrote the poem, Teach us, good Lord, how to forgive and be forgiven, that we be at ease with one another and with you, and may walk together unafraid in the way of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, he, of course, also wrote the famous Coventry Litany, which is said throughout the world, as well as here. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. Father, forgive the covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Father, forgive the greed that exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Father, forgive our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Father, forgive our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Father, forgive the lust which dishonours the bodies of men, women and children. Father, forgive. The pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not in God. Father, forgive. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as Christ forgave you. Amen. Amen. Coventry is an amazing place. It is the foundation of reconciliation. The foundation of my ministry throughout the world today is here. The fact that these buildings are iconic in the city of Coventry is really important. We have a, a, a space here where we remember particularly what happened then. And we look forward now through our buildings, through our story, and really importantly through action to what the city of Coventry can be in terms of peace and reconciliation in the future. The World War II created situations, the Holocaust being one, but there are many others, which we dare not forget. Because those who forget the past are condemned to relive it, as somebody once said. So uh, I think that I think the story, and of course the Coventry story is rooted in something that happened in the past, but which has echoes for the present and the future, of course, all the time. And uh, may, I mean, I think several times we've had to, so to speak, rework the story, reinterpret the story, but it's the same basic story, and it and it goes back to World War Two. I don't think there's any way you can get you can avoid that. It is utterly relevant because it is the narrative, the testimony to God's extraordinary work. And when told with realism that there, are still, there were still people who remembered the bombing when I was a canon there and who still hated the Germans, and I understand where they came from on that. I'm not judging them, who lost friends and family. Coventry springs out of that prophetic moment of Father Forgive. When that story is told, and is told by people bearing this cross of nails who demonstrate that that still is alive in them. I think for Coventry, World War II does have a role. For most people, I think we've moved on from that. And I don't think we should just look back 
to one event of the past, but we should look at now and see how we can take people forwards. And if there's anything from the message of the 14th of November 1940, it is that we must keep moving forward and we must not stop. We must remember our history, but I think to only focus on our history is a big mistake. So while World War II is fundamentally important to our Ministry of Reconciliation here, we now also need to look ahead, to look at where reconciliation is needed in the world today. At the moment we have a huge refugee crisis, refugees from Syria flooding into Europe. And I'm very concerned that we engage with this, both as a cathedral and as a city. Coventry City, I believe, has always been a city of sanctuary for refugees and asylum seekers, and we need to build on that. I think one of the challenges the cathedral faces, and this is not new, and so this is not rocket science, because I think it, it, it goes right back to the new cathedral and to Bill Williams. It goes back to the city. Who owns the reconciliation vision in Coventry? Who is the community that delivers it beyond the professional staff of canons, people like me who come in to be the canon for reconciliation? I think every canon for reconciliation or international canon has struggled with that one. It still remains, I think, a challenge uh, for us. And that's what we need to capture. To see more Anglican parishes, cathedrals, even dioceses around the worldwide communion, joining the community of Cross of Nails, would be incredible and actually would be a gift uh, not only just to the communion but actually to the world because 80% of Anglicans around the world live in situations of conflict and post-conflict situation. If we were to have 100 new Anglican churches around the world join the community of Cross of Nails that could be a game changer both for the life of the cathedral in touching conflict situations from Burundi to Sri Lanka to Malaysia it could be a game changer internally to the life of the communion because it would give more authenticity to the cathedral being at the heart of a network for reconciliation with the divisions in, in the communion. Uh, and I think it would be a game changer for the city because it really would help the vision spread. You know, the majority of partners in the community across the nails are within Europe. And yet where the world conflict is, is, is outside of Europe at the moment, and, and that's where it needs to be. And so I, I think that is a big challenge. The challenges for reconciliation that are coming, that are here already, in fact, are to do with the rise of fundamentalism, to do with ISIS, to do with the effects of that conflict and that worldview particularly at the moment with the, with the refugee crisis. So that's one challenge that we really need to grasp. I think other challenges are to do with Europe, are to do with how Europe is or remains unified or not. And I think that's something that we, we need to engage with. I think um, the fracturing of Europe would be a big, big mistake. Um, and that's something that I, I'm thinking about and would like us to have an input into over the, the coming months. Other challenges are to do with ecology. And there are people throughout the world who are suffering because of the effects of conflict on their land, what war does to the ability to grow crops, and in terms of climate change, and all the other issues around that. So that's, that's another big reconciliation challenge for us. Because if, if we don't start trying to reconcile how we treat the earth, then there will be little point in, ha in trying to reconcile with each other. For me, the threat of interfaith and religiously justified violence is the, for me, the big issue in human reconciliation. 
What is it that's causing this upsurge of violence? How do we understand it and what are we going to do about it? How do we as Christians engage with this, not in revenge or hatred, but in the self-sacrificing love of Christ, incarnationally, in a cross-shaped way, and in a way that enables other religious traditions to find their own peace, and mainstream groups within them to find a narrative, a story, that outpaces the shallow, terrifying attraction of the Kalashnikov and the Semtex. That, I think, is, is the great generational challenge. And the imposition of violence to stop violence will never be a definitive answer. There are police actions necessary. Police action is one thing, but the change of heart is the key one. No one community is without sin. Uh, and that goes to the heart of the Coventry story of reconciliation. The litany begins with all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And that, that is where the capacity to tell one's own story in a way that rather than excludes and is used to exclude the person you've been at enmity with, you then re your story to include them. And in that way, their pain, which you may have caused your community, may have caused becomes your pain and vice versa. And reconciliation begins to happen at, at that point of relationship. Well, the most pressing reconciliation need in the world at the moment is very much dealing with this major religious divide which is going on. And at the moment, most of that divide is actually an Islamic divide. It is not between Christians and Muslims, it's between Muslims and Muslims. And that's one of the things we have got to deal with. And I'm only able to deal with it because of what I learnt here at Coventry. And I cannot underestimate the significance of what this place means to reconciliation from the 14th of November 1940, was built from Dick Howard, the future of reconciliation in the world today. And whether it's those of you who are still based here at Coventry, or those of us who have moved on from here, we are still taking forward this message, Father, forgive. The problem is that forgiveness to many other religious traditions, both in Judaism and Islam, is not a central tenement of their faith tradition. So we have to work at that, work at trying to show people that all of us are called to be people of forgiveness. I suppose in a Christian context, the enemy is fundamentalism. The enemy is the idea that we are right and everybody else is wrong. Um, and fighting fundamentalism of every kind within the church, within society, um, is the immediate task. And it's on the increase everywhere. The negative sides of all religions are thriving. Intolerant Christianity versus intolerant Islam. And that intolerance, historically and in the present, uh, is not a theory. It kills people on a large scale. The task of this cathedral is, among other things, a deep respect and tolerance of other religions, but first of all to recognize there is so much in Christian tradition and in our own tradition that we have to fight. In other words, the enemy is within. Um, it's not somewhere out there. And uh, I think we have to confront it. And here is the paradox. Confront it and still love the enemy. So the task of loving ourselves is part of being a decent Christian and a decent human being. Self-hatred is often expressed in hatred of others who, onto whom we project 
our own weaknesses. Um, so that's a universal battle in every age and in every time, but we have to define it and recognize it, and particularly in the Britain of today, recognizing a culture that becomes more and more self-centered and individualistic. I think the rejection of being part of a wider European family, which is so widespread in Britain, is one of the things the church has to be fighting. It isn't just should we be members of the European Union or not, but are we part of this Europe that is part of our culture, our tradition and our past? We may not like some of it, as we may not like some of ourselves, but um, the European question is part of the church's task to say yes. And that immediately leads us to the question that is now flooding, yes, f literally flooding across the Mediterranean, the, the poverty and the persecution of masses of people in the African continent who despair and look at our wealth and look at how we live and want to share it. Just as British people went all over the world to conquer it, to benefit from it, our whole colonial history is colonizing other people for our own benefit. And now it's coming back to us. How are we going to face that as a church? I think at one level, the most pressing need is not to think it's done. So if we take Europe, for example, you know, the danger, you, know, you just have to listen to the dialogue around Greece. Uh, the Germans should bail us out because they stole all our gold. Uh, you just need to listen to the dialogue about majority voting in the European Union. Poland saying, well, if it wasn't for the Germans, we would be the biggest nation in, in, in Europe. Uh, so all those tensions are never far be below the surface. So we, as Europeans, we should not give up on our reconciliation project and we have a government that's about to lead us in to a vote that could take us out of the European Union, which would be tragic. In 1974, there was a service of celebration at Coventry Cathedral for voting to go into the European Economic Community. And then it has to be Islam. And how, how does Islam itself respond to modernity? And how do we respond to an Islam that is in crisis, that is a meltdown between Sunnah and Shia? How do we respond uh, without panicking because at the time that I'm giving this response to you it's probably running at 10,000 to 1 of Muslims who are being killed by Daesh and others as against outsiders. Uh, so we've created this fear that it's about our security. No it isn't. The M Muslim world is turning in on itself but we need to stop panicking. We need to listen to that. We need to realise that the reason why many young people in our own society, second and third generation Muslims who live here, are being attracted to it is the narrative of the humiliation of Islam and the exploitation of the resources of the Levant and the Gulf is one that rings true to them. And that w we need to acknowledge that our foreign policy ha has created a context in which they find it easy to grow. Uh, doesn't in any way justify them, doesn't say it's right. But we need to respond to that. And I think that is the biggest need. How do we deal with religiously motivated violence that is expressing itself in the Islamic world? It threatens to suck us all into a catastrophe. The only piece of advice I can give is love your enemies. And so much of our time and work is dealing with enemies. And it's by showing them love and giving them something that you can give hope. At its simplest, it's about sharing ourselves and our food and our stories and our lives with people who are different, who we may not agree with, people who may not be anything like us. But that's where we start and that's what I really want to enable people to feel that they can at least do that because then people can feel that they can play a part in healing our world rather than feeling helpless or hopeless about it. Hope 
is a big factor in reconciliation. And if I can help people be hopeful and feel empowered and that they have a role to play, then that's what I aim to do. How is it possible to engage others in the Ministry of Reconciliation? I presume, I can only presume by doing and being and not just talking by an example. Um, Coventry was always, in a sense, tried to set a model which others could follow. In fact, I, uh, when I learned about what Coventry was doing in India, before I ever came to Coventry, I knew that this was something I wanted to be part of. I think one of the things that the cathedral needs to realise that while it may have occupied a unique position post-1940 and in the post-war world, uh, it is no longer unique and to a degree has actually been overtaken by many initiatives and many others. And so the cathedral needs to hold itself a little bit more modestly than maybe it has done in the past. And it is a great story, it is a powerful story, it had its time and place but it's not the only one now. And it's not the only powerful story out there. So it needs to ask itself, what can it therefore bring to the game? Because its story is no longer sufficient to carry it. And for me, that has to be about quality. It has to be about raising our game in terms of facilities in which we host people. Because I do still think there's a powerful narrative of the building from the ruins to the new cathedral. And it is amazing how people bring all of their conflicts with them when they come on that pilgrimage to this space. People who've now made Coventry their home come and bring their pain and their narrative of their conflicts and their journeys of reconciliation. And they bring them to the ruins and they hold them there. And they begin to make their story part of our story as a city. And this was brought home to me by one of the first things when I came here was going to an exhibition of art by recently arrived refugees and probably in seven out of 10 art pieces, the cathedral ruins appeared in it. And we asked people why, they said, that's where we went in our worst days when we first arrived, to be able to sit there at lunchtime in a holy place and reflect. Then maybe that's how we can help build peace and we can make that message go home. And I think we need to create the space for that. The cathedral has got to be seem to be genuinely international, genuinely ecumenical, that is, seeing itself as part of a wider church uh, that is not just Church of England. And I think everybody who works here has got to work in that wider framework, um, wider and paradoxically narrower. The cathedral has also got to become ingrained in this city um, and not just there for the word world. And I would say if we still think we can be a respectable nation and be prepared to use nuclear weapons if the test comes and become mass murderers, which is the present consensus, we need this Trident missile, not for military purposes, but to demonstrate our potential power, and that is to create another holocaust if anybody touches us. If we're prepared to do that, we've surrendered our humanity and not only our Christianity. I carry with me in my mind the image of Christ in glory behind the high altar at Coventry, and in my heart, there is that memory of sitting in my stall at Evensong on the days before I travelled to somewhere dangerous and difficult, feeling sick and frightened and looking at the man standing between the feet of Jesus, overshadowed, unable to see the Christ who protected him. And I carry with me those extraordinary words in the great bronze letters at the back of the cathedral at the west end on the floor. On 14th November 1940, this cathedral burned to the glory of God. And that sense of what human beings can destroy, God raises up. And also the great west screen with the insanely dancing, bopping angels 
going completely crazy. And that sense of the figure of Christ at one end and the bopping angels at the other. And next to them, the sun bursting through the baptistry window. The darkness of the Chapel of Unity, so often reflecting the darkness and chaos of our disunity in the church and the call to the world in the Chapel of Industry. The piece of the Chapel of Stalingrad Madonna, my favorite place to sit and pray silently in the cathedral. And that sense of a place that knows what it's for and provided it holds that sense will always find itself in the center of God's will. Coventry Cathedral takes hold of you. It becomes a very profound experience, partly the beauty of the place. I think the, the outward shell has an inward resonance. The work of artists who express in their art what it's all about becomes part of you and it becomes part of your prayer life. You, you never you can't shake it off.